in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at this. This is one of those scriptures that you have to learn to memorize and all of them, by the way, the, the, especially these ones that I'm going to be using to this morning. But let's look at this. Second Timothy, chapter three, verse 15, second Timothy, three, 15 through 17. Verse 15, Paul is writing to young Timothy. He says that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Look at this through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So young Timothy knew the word of God. He knew the holy scriptures. The Old Testament was his grandmother and his mother read it to him, which were able to make him wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. So by the reading and the studying of the word of God as a young child, that opened up his knowledge to who Jesus Christ is. It opened up the word of God to him and the word of God began to have an effect in his life. The Bible says that the Bible, it works what? Effectually in you that what? In you that believe. Well, this book has an effect in your life. It transforms you. It changes you. But it only has an effect in the people that believe. The people who don't believe, the word of God has no effect in their lives. They can listen to the message. They can hear things about the Bible. But it doesn't have any transformation. It doesn't have any illumination. And it doesn't literally transform their lives. Because it doesn't have an effect in their life. Is because they truly don't believe the word of God. And so, young Timothy here. Yeah, the Bible had an effect in his life. The word of God affected him. It affected the way he thought. It affected the way he lived. It affected his priorities. It transformed him as a man when he became a man. And that's why he became a follower of Paul and he became a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? It's because the word of God did something in his life. It literally transformed him. That's what the word of God does for the people who believe, the people who've experienced Jesus Christ in the word of God it literally transcends their mind their actions and the way they live and then he writes here all scripture is given by what inspiration of God now that word inspiration it's a very unique word it's only mentioned two times in the Bible but it basically means God what breathe that's what it means it means God breathed okay so when we look at the Bible the King James Bible that book is literally the very breath of Almighty God it's the very breath when God speaks into existence the living Word of God that book is alive people and let me tell you something it has power there's nothing more powerful than the Word of God and the authority of God there's nothing more gratifying and significant in this life apart from the very Word of God all scripture is given by inspiration. In other words, it's God breathed. And when we talk about all scripture, we mean in the authorized version. No other Bible is literally God breathed. No other word of God is inspired by God himself. Now watch this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And we see that it's what? Profitable for doctrine, which is teaching, for reproof, okay? For correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So you know what the word of God does? It perfects you as a human being. The word of God, ne you're never going to be perfect, okay? Do we all understand that? But what the word of God does, it perfects you. In other words, it brings you to this point where it's perfecting you, it's building you, it's strengthening you, it's encouraging you. The word of God is perfecting the way you think. The word of God is perfecting your relationship with God. The word of God is perfecting you in being a vessel of honor for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's maturing you. It's developing you. It's growing you. It's literally bringing you through a process where the word of God is conforming you into the very image of Jesus Christ. And so we see that word inspiration. I want you to circle that word. Pay attention to that because that's what we're going to be using in just a few more moments. So the word of God, it's what? It's God breathe. Now, when God formed Adam, what did he do? He breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and Adam became a what? A living soul. So the breath of God is what gives life. Do you understand that? Right now, you are living and breathing and you are alive. It's because of God keeping you alive. Now, there are people here, in, in not here, but in, the, in this crazy world we live in, that they think that they are self-sustainable. You ever think about that? You ever think about how crazy people are? 
You, you, I mean, think about it. I'm doing a message on, uh, at 11 o'clock. It's called The Audacity of Humanity. I originally titled it The Stupidity of Humanity, but somebody allured me to change it. So we, we're going to go with The Audacity of Humanity. But you have to understand something. It's literally the Word of God that is keeping you alive right now. It's the Word of God that is allowing you to breathe, that's allowing your eyes to blink, that's allowing your heart to pump, that's allowing blood to flow through your veins. It's the living Word of God that sustains us in keeps us alive Amen. it's that book that keeps you alive people don't you, you you wouldn't even exist without it so we have to understand how important is the very word of God okay so we seen that God breathed into Adam's life, the breath of life and Adam became a what a living soul so Adam was had the inspiration of the Almighty so when we look at the Bible the word of God it's literally the breath of God and it's the very life of you and I now let's look at this right but I want you to turn to second Peter chapter 1 second Peter chapter 1 in verse 19 second Peter chapter 1 in verse 19 it says here we also have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart now if you look at verse 19, just look at that verse again. It says, we ha also have a more sure word of prophecy. Okay? The Bible is a sure word. When we talk about this assured word, the only thing you can count on in this world is that book. Do you understand that? You can't rely on anything else in this world. You can't count on anything. There are people in your life that you think you can count on and you realize that you can't. But the only thing, the only thing that we have in this life is the more sure word of prophecy. The Bible is more assured than the audible voice of God. Do you understand that? Somebody may say, well, God told me and God spoke to me. I'll say, well, let me tell you something. You've got a more sure word of prophecy in that book than the audible voice of God. Do you understand that? The Bible is literally, it's better than the voice of God himself speaking directly to you. Because this is what it is. It is the voice of God. It is the essence of God's being, his nature, his holiness, his righteousness, his justness, his glory. It's, it shows us his attributes, his thoughts. It, it shows us his will for all of mankind. So we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place. Now remember, thy word is a what? It's a lamp and it's a what? And it's a light under my path. So what does the word of God do? We take heed as a what? As a light that shineth in a dark place. We're living in a dark world right now and the world is getting darker and darker and darker all around us and the only hope that you see, I have uh, the ability to see is through the word of God. That is the only thing. The only hope that we have is to literally let the word of God illuminate our minds, illuminate our hearts, illuminate our understanding, and the eyes of our understanding are enlightened, and we know what's happening all around us. But apart from the word of God, you, my friend, will be in darkness, without hope, without understanding, without knowledge, without direction. That's the world we live in. People are in darkness because the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. Amen. Then we go on. Now watch this, right? A light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. The day dawn, that is Jesus Christ. The day star, that is Jesus Christ. And where does he arise? In your hearts. That Christ will dwell where people? In your hearts by what? By faith that you are rooted and grounded in his love. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the word of God, the portions of scripture, that no prophecy of scripture is of any what? Private interpretation. I was dealing with some kid the other day and on the phone and he was telling me, well, that's just your interpretation. And I said to him, oh, it is, huh? Then you interpret to me. When the Bible says death and hell, okay, uh, death, d hell delivered up death and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. I says, you interpret that to me. What does it say? How are you going to interpret for whosoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the what? Lake of fire. This guy had me so mad if I could have reached through the phone, I would have strangled him. He's telling me, he's telling me that there's no hell. I said, I said to him, if there's no hell, why do I preach the Bible? If there's no hell, why do we go to church? If there's no hell, why did Jesus Christ die? If there's no hell, what is the purpose of everything? If there's no hell, that means you don't understand the holiness and the righteousness of God Almighty. 
He has no concept of the nature of God. There has to be a hell just like there's a heaven. No prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. We don't sit here and say, well, what did, how do you interpret this? How do you? Listen, in scripture, what people interprets what? Itself. itself. Right. It always interprets itself. No prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. Now look at this. For the prophecy, the word of God, the proclamations of God himself in the pages of scripture. It came not in old time by the will of man. Do you ever think about that? You know, man would have done. Man would have made himself look good, right? It didn't come by the will of man. It didn't come. Man didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write a Bible. Because you know what man would have did, right? He would have made himself great. He would have made himself good. Man would have never have wrote that there is none righteous, no, not one. Man would have never have condemned himself to hell without Jesus Christ. Man would have built up and made himself some sort of religion that made him feel good about himself. That's what man would have done. Didn't come, but holy men of God, they spake as that. Now, here's the word. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. These men were literally being compelled and pushed. God says, this is what you're going to write. This is how you're going to put it down. You're going to do it the exact way I want you to do it. These men were literally possessed with the Holy Spirit of God. They were under, uh, uh, literally, they were under the influence of the Spirit of God. And they wrote exactly what God had them to write. And that's in the authorized version. God purified and preserved his word in the English speaking language in this book. Okay. He purified it seven times. He preserved it. He protected it down through history. That's what God did. God says, I'm not going to leave man without my word. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to purify it. I'm going to preserve it. I'm going to protect it. I'm going to make sure that nobody can defile it. Nobody can touch it because I want them to have my word. I want them to know my thoughts. I want them to know my nature. I want them to know my attributes. I want them to know my character. I want to have communion with them. Therefore, I'm going to protect my word. I'm going to preserve my word and I'm going to purify my word. That book is not tainted. It hasn't been altered. It hasn't been twisted or perverted. It's been purified seven times as it has been in the furnace of the earth. Okay, now I want you to turn to John chapter 6 and verse 63. So we're on this process about the word of God. We've seen the word inspiration. Okay, now let's look at this. John chapter 6 and verse 63. Jesus makes a very profound statement here. He says, it is the spirit that what? It's the spirit that brings life, okay? It's the Holy Spirit of God that quickened you. The day you were born again, the Holy Spirit came inside of you, and you know what he did? He quickened your dead spirit. Do you understand that? You were spiritually dead. You were spiritually, literally an annihilated being. You were spiritually without Christ. You had no hope. You were spiritually dead, and the Spirit of God came inside of you, and you know what he did? He quickened you. In other words, that spirit came inside of you, one of the seven mysteries, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's what? He's none of his. And the spirit came inside of you and it quickened you. It made you come alive. Aren't you glad for that, guys? Man, that spirit came inside of you. You looked at the world different. You see things different. You process things different. The spirit took your dead spirit. And what did he do? He quickened you. See, quicken means to made alive. It is the spirit that quickeneth. Now, notice this verse here. The flesh prophets what? Nothing. Nothing. Jesus Christ was telling them about eating his flesh. But they took it literally. So Jesus was expounding the word of God to them. He says the flesh prophets what? It prophets nothing. Now, we can apply that to your everyday life. This stinking canister of flesh, it doesn't mean anything. God's more concerned about your spirit being saved. OK, it's the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profits nothing. Now, watch the latter part of this. Look what Jesus says. The words that I speak unto you, they are what? And what else are they? OK, so now we have a dual personality in the word of God. First, he says they're what? They're spirit. OK, so when we look at the book, the Bible, it's supernatural. Do you guys understand that? This book, some people say you King James only guys, you guys think that God came down from heaven and just handed you the book. Praise God. He did. That's what my God did. 
Let me tell you something. Those corrupt translation, ASV, NM, any, any one of them. God didn't hand him that book. The devil came down or the devil came up <laughs> and handed him that book. These people think, oh, you King James only guys, you guys believe. Yeah, because if I serve a God who couldn't purify, protect and preserve his word, what kind of God do I have? Think about it. My God, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke this world into existence, my God, the one who controls all things, the one who has sovereignty and providence over everything. He said, nobody's going to taint my word. Nobody's going to taint it. And he took his people. He used his people to purify and preserve his word. The God I serve he didn't give me some translation. I've got the very written word of God. Amen. I have a more sure word of what? Prophecy. Amen. That book is the only sure thing in this life. Amen. You mark it down. It's the only thing you can count on. It's the only thing you can rely on. It's the only thing you can depend on. That's right. yes, sir. Now watch this, right? So Jesus says that what? They are what? They are spirit. So he, at first essence, they're what? They're spirit. So the Bible, it's a supernatural book. It's spiritual. Okay? That's why the natural man receives what? Not the things of the spirit of God. Neither can he know them because they're what? They're foolish unto him because they're spiritually what? They're spiritually discerned. Somebody without the Holy Spirit of God, they look at that Bible and they're just like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Of course it doesn't make any sense. You don't have the spirit. Therefore, you can't understand the very word of God. Because it's the word of God that gives you the revelation. It's the word of God that gives you the comprehension. Did you know it was the word of God? It was Christ in you, the hope of glory that even draws you to the Bible. Did you know that? Amen, Did you? Some of you guys didn't know that, right? Amen. That's why some people have no desire for the Bible because they don't have any desire for truth because they don't have the spirit of Christ in them. Right. It's he which worketh in you both to what? To will and to do of his good pleasure. Okay. So the word of God, it's spirit. And then he says here, and they are what? They are life. He said, Jesus Christ says, the words that I'm speaking to you, they're spiritual, they're supernatural. But also it's the essence of life. It's the very essence of life. Guys, I, I quote this scripture, but I don't know if some of you always get it. In him we what? We live, we move, and we what? Have our being. When God created man, it was with his word. When God created this earth, it was with his word. The word of God is what sustains life. It's what sustains us. The word of God is what it's the sustaining factor of life. The word of God, the very breath of life. Listen, in him, we live, we move and we have our being. Amen. Amen. We live, we move, we exist because of his word. Apart from, apart from him, there is nothing. There is anything. In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. Now look at this, right? So he says that Jesus says, it's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are what? They are spirit, and they are what? They are life. Now watch this, right? Stay with me, right? And they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. See that? Jesus says, hey, there's some of you guys that don't believe. Just like here right now, there's somebody that doesn't believe. You're not always going to get all believers. I'm not, I'm not a dummy. You might be sitting in your seat right now, and you just be like, you're automatically already on complete shutdown. You don't know what I'm talking about. You have no desire for the word of God because you don't have the spirit of God. You've never been born again by the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, you have no connection from God. You are disconnected. So everything I'm saying literally just bounces off your heart because your heart is wax grows. It goes in one ear and out the other ear. Jesus says, seeing you see not and hearing what? You hear not. For in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Your heart is wax grows. That's where a lot of people are. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning, look at this, who they were that believe not and who should betray him. There's God's sovereign will. You know, I know God's not willing that any should perish, but God knows who's going to accept him and who's going to reject him. Amen. Okay. Now watch this, verse 65. And he said, therefore, said unto, un, I unto you that no, look at this, that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my father. 
from that time, look at this, many of his disciples, they went back and walked no more with him. Now, let me explain to you historically what was happening here. At this point, there was a big controversial uprage about walking with Jesus Christ. And there were people that were being put out of the synagogue. They began to persecute the nation. They began to persecute Jesus Christ and his followers. At this point, they had planned on killing Jesus Christ. They had already planned on killing him, but now they're really zoning in. Let us destroy this man. Let us kill him. So a lot of the disciples, they went, way, they went back and turned their back. And they said, I'm, this is getting too hairy for me. This is getting too risky for me. And they turned their back on him. From that time, verse 66. Notice the chapter. It's chapter 6, and it's verse what? 66. So you've got 666. Six, six. From that time, many of his disciples went back and what? Walked no more with him. Think about it. They just said, we're not doing this anymore. Verse 67, then said Jesus unto the 12, will you also go away? And then Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, now I love this. To whom shall we go? Where are we going to go? Thou hast said out loud the what? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? Peter's like, God, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. You've got to come to your point in this life and you've got to say to yourself, where, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? The only thing that matters is that book and the word of God. Peter's like, well, God, wh where are we going to go? You think I'm going to go back fishing again? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do with my life? I have met the Messiah, the son of the living God. He speaks life into my soul. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? What am I going to turn to? How much money am I going to make? Nothing else matters. You have the words of eternal life. Nothing else mattered. Nothing else mattered. Until you get to that point in your life, you will never or may you have never experienced Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh yeah, you went to church, you might have gotten baptized. But when you step back and you're just like this, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? I've got nowhere else to go. I've got nothing else I want to do. I've got nothing else in this world that I want to accomplish. But that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Amen. That I may know him where else are you going to go? What are you going to do? Let me ask you that question yourself. What do you think life is going to bring you? What are you trying to accomplish in this world? What is your goal? What is your direction? Hey, guys, it is appointed on a man once to what? Die. And after this, the what? The judgment. You remember Solomon? He writes the book of Ecclesiastes. How many read Ecclesiastes? Put your hand up. He writes the book of life. He writes the book of Ecclesiastes. He writes about all of his accomplishments, all of his wealth, all of his prosperity, all of his, uh, all the things he's obtained in this world. And he said it was all what? Vanities and vexation of spirit. He comes to the end of that life and he says, man, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work with every secret thing into judgment. That's what he said. I know some of us don't see life like that. Peter seen it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 67, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you go away? Will you also go away? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of what? Eternal life. What are you going to do? In, what are you going to do in this world? That old King James Bible is the word of eternal life. Amen. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Drink at the living water. I mean. Me personally, like what Jesus says to the woman at the well, whosoever drinks of this water shall what? Thirst shall thirst again. But he says, whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him. What does it say? Out of him. He's never going to thirst. And out of him is going to flow what? Livers of rivering water. 
living, rivers of living water. Man, have you ever experienced that? When you get to the point where the only thing that thrills you is that book. That's it. Oh, let's go here. Let's do this. Ah. Let's do this. Let's go here. Let's travel. Let's do this. Let's do this. No, I want to see God. Some of you say, oh man, Pastor Mike gets pretty boring. <laughs> yep. But watch what, watch what he says, right? He says, you, Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. What you spoke, what you said in him was what? Life. And life was the what? Light of man. Jesus is life himself. Amen. We live, we move, we exist because he is is life. Amen. Thou has the words of eternal life. Now look at this, right? And we believe. And what does he say? We believe in a what? And are sure that thou what? Out the Christ. We believe. We know that you are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You have life. You are life. Now, so let's stay with me, right? So I want you to turn to First Peter now, okay? Now, remember what Peter just quoted, okay? Now, Peter writes his, he, he writes his epistle in 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 23, okay? So he understands that Jesus is what? He's life. He says, you are the Christ. You, are, where are we going to go? You have the words of what? Eternal life. So Peter makes the connection. Does everyone understand that? You guys with me on that, right? Peter makes the connection. Later on, he writes this epistle in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Now Peter has the comprehension. Now he has the understanding. Now he has the anointing of the Spirit of God. And now he knows what it means. It says, being born again, not of a what? Corruptible seed, but by what? An incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. He says, it was the word of God that give us life. You see, Peter looked at Jesus Christ and he says, you are life. <coughs> Guys, it's the word of God that gives you life. It's the word. You were born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of what? Incorruptible seed by the what? The word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God is life. It's the very seed to life within itself. Born again. It's not corruptible. It's an incorruptible seed. Listen, your first birth is a corruptible thing. That's why this corruptible and this mortal must put on what? Immortality. So how do we do that? By being born again. Receiving the incorruptible word of God. The seed, the living word of God. Now watch. Notice what he says. Which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, down through the centuries, people have to try, they've tried to annihilate the Bible. Do you know that? I did a message. That Bible is the most hated book in the universe. No one has ever hated the Bible more than any other book. The Quran, forget it. Not even close. They've tried to extinguish Christianity. They've tried to extinguish the Jewish people. They've tried to extinguish anything that is related to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That book has been the most hated book in the universe. Amen. Jesus Christ was the most hated man throughout all of history, still to this day. People hate him. They've never even met him. They've never even had an encounter with him, yet they hate him. You could talk about anyone but Jesus. And Trump, too. <laughs> you ever notice you bring up Trump, people have a fit? <laughs> now watch this, right? He goes on. Which liveth and abideth forever. So the word of God is eternal. Okay. There was never a time when the word of God was not. And there never will be a time when the word of God what? Is not. Do you understand that? What we have in your hand is the very eternal word of God. All right. Now watch this. For all flesh is as grass. All right. Your body, your life, your flesh in this world is just like grass. It's just going to wither away. Do you understand that? Does everyone understand that? Guys, you, you, can, you can cut it out there. You can get out there and try to make that lawn look wonderful. And it'll look good. But once that fall comes along, once that winter comes along, that grass stops growing. It stops flourishing. It's not green anymore. And it doesn't look good anymore. Just like your flesh. You can pick, cat it up and make it up and, and do all you want to it. It's only going to look so good for so long. 
Do you, does everyone understand that? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, some of you people are like, oh, it's wonderful. Oh, yeah? Give it another 10 years. <laughs> it withereth away like a flower thereof, and it falleth away. And then he says, but the word of the Lord, what? It doeth forever. Mm. See that? The word of God endures forever. It endures forever, the past, the present, and the future. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Amen. He says the word of God lives forever. Guys, you're not just reading a book that was written by man. You are literally reading the very mind and the heart of Almighty God. You're reading the creator of the universe, the designer of the universe. You are reading his thoughts. You are reading his plan, his purpose for what's happening in this world. That's what you're reading. If you think about it, it says that we were born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of what? An incorruptible seed by the what? The word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Now, so it's the word of God that saves us. Look at this, right? You were born again by the word of God. That's what saved you. It was the word of God. If you look at James chapter 1, verse 21, turn over there, James chapter 1, verse 21. James chapter 1, verse 21. James chapter 1, verse 21. Now watch how this works, right? James chapter 1, verse 21. It says here, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfility of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word. You see this? Which is able to what? Save Did you see that? So it's the word of God that saves you. You remember when the soul went out to sow and he sowed the seed? And then when it's inter Jesus interprets it in Luke chapter 8, he says the seed is the what? It's the word of God. It's the word of God. It's the word of God that saves you. How you embrace the word of God shows me whether you've been saved or not. How you view the Bible shows me your standing with God. Because it's the word of God that saves you. It gave you the illumination, the comprehension, the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. It was the word of God that literally sprung up in your heart, that brought forth salvation, that brings forth eternal life. Listen, if you don't receive the word of God, you will die in your sins and go to hell without God. It's the word of God that saves you. So if you look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says there, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. The Bible says without faith, it's what? It's impossible to please God. You can't please God without faith. So faith has to be literally obtained. Faith is obtained through the word of God. So when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it literally comes through the written word of God. You see who Jesus Christ is? You realize what he's done for you on the cross? You realize that you can't save yourself. So what do you do? You put your faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, you depend on him. You rely on him. You count on Jesus to get you into heaven. Who's counting on anything else other than Jesus Christ in this room? Hopefully nobody. Are you counting on Jesus Christ to get you into heaven? Amen. Amen. Are you counting on your baptism, communion, sacraments, or good works? No. God, no. I wouldn't count on any of that. Are you counting on yourself being a good person? Not the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. You're just a bunch of filthy, rotten snakes and vipers. Read John the Baptist when he opens up to the nation of Israel. They come to hear him and he goes, you're just filled with dead men's bones. <laughs> that was how his message started. You think I'm a hard preacher. I ain't got nothing on those guys. Now watch this, right? Let's do this. So we see the, the incensions of faith and the word of God. We're saved by the word of God. Now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. Matthew 5, 18. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18. And this will, we'll, I'll finish this uh, message next week. But let's look at this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Now watch this. One jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay? So listen, you can destroy this world 
but you can't destroy the book. This whole world is going up in smoke, but the word of God liveth and abideth for what? Forever. Forever in the past, forever in the present, forever in the future. Now look at Matthew. Look at Matthew 24, okay? Matthew 24 and verse 35. Matthew 24, verse 35. Now watch this, guys. Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but watch this, but my word shall what? Not pass away. Now, uh, just pause there for a minute. It's very clear in the word of God that heaven and earth shall what? Pass away, but the word of God liveth and abideth for what? Forever. So that when the Bible says heaven and earth are going to pass away, it's very clear in the word of God. You can read about it over there in the book of Revelation. You can read about it in 2 Timothy chapter 3. You can go over and over and over that this world's going to be annihilated and destroyed. Does everyone understand that? Yeah. Let me tell you something. The judgment day is coming when the Bible says that the earth and all the things that are therein shall what? Shall melt with a fervent heat, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of person ought you to be? Heaven and earth shall pass away. If that book tells me heaven and earth shall pass away, that's a promise from God himself. That is a promise from the lips of Jesus Christ, from the very lips and the heartbeat of God himself. This world will pass. It will pass. It will pass. It will be destroyed by the sovereign hand of almighty God. My question to you is, so what are you holding on to that's more dear than this? This is life. Your job, your career. This is life. The word is life. Without that, we have nothing. Heaven and earth will pass. It will pass. It will be destroyed. But his words shall not pass. Take hold of eternal life the very word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for who you are. We just thank you for the word of God. And thank you for what you've given to us in the pages of scripture, what it contains, what it reveals to us, Lord. We thank you for all things, Lord. And thank you for giving us a book that we can rely on, depend on. Thank you for the living, moving, breathing word of God. the inspiration of the Almighty. And Lord, we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for who you are. We pray for your presence upon the service, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.